All right. Happy Sabbath, brethren. Good to be back with you. Missed you all while we were away in visiting the Michigan congregation. Glad to be back with you all. Um, today, uh, by the way, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, greetings from uh, Church of God Woodstock to all you saints scattered abroad. Truth on the Web Ministries uh, welcomes you. Uh, today we are going to be looking at uh, the concept of a righteous lie, a noble lie. Is such an idea biblical? Uh, speaking a lie in love. Uh, is it ever the will of God for Christians to lie? That's my subtitle. Of course, you notice uh, I borrowed this from the scripture where it says speaking the truth in love. But to uh, bring up across the point of what's at hand, um, some, actually many propose the idea that um, Christians can lie in certain situations and it's a good thing. That the, uh, the ends justifies the means. It's a good thing to lie at certain times. So <clears throat> let's begin generally where they begin. <clears throat> the children of Israel had just come out of the wilderness. There are four years in the wilderness, and they're coming to spy out the land that was promised to them. So Joshua, the son of Nun, this is Joshua chapter 2. We're going to read this chapter. He sent out to Shittim two men as spies secretly, saying, Go and view the land and Jericho. So they went, and they came to the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab. And they laid there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in here tonight of the children of Israel to search out the land. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men who are come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. The woman took the two men and hid them, and she said, uh, Yes, the men came to me, but I didn't know whence they were. I didn't know where they were coming. I didn't know they were Israelites. I didn't know where they came from. And it happened about the time of the start of the gate, when it was dark, that they went out. Uh, so where they are now, I don't know. But if you run after them quickly, you can probably overtake them. But she had actually brought them up on the roof. And she hid them with the stalks of flax that were up there uh, drying on the roof. They were laid there in order on the roof, drying in the sun. So the king's men pursued after the spies the way to the Jordan, to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. Continuing in verse 8. Before they were laid down, Rahab came up to them on the roof and said to the man, I know that Yehovah has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen on us, and all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. So we have heard how Yehovah has dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. So, look, at this is something she's saying. She's talking about events from 40 years ago, what happened with the Red Sea. and So, we've heard about this for a long time coming, and we're in fear and dread. As soon as we heard it, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more spirit in any man because of you. For Yehovah, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, please swear to me by Yehovah, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with my father's house and give me a true token, that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all that they have and will deliver our lives from death. So the men said to her, Our life for yours. If you don't utter this our business, it shall be when Yehovah gives us the land that we will deliver kindly and truly with you. 
So she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was on the side of the wall, and she lived on the wall. She said to them, get to the mountain, lest the pursuers light on you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and then afterwards you can go on your way. Now I want to note something here, because I'm not going to bring this up in the slides later, but notice what even what the spies say. They didn't say, hey, lie for us. They just said, don't tell anybody what we're doing. They just asked her to refrain her mouth. So here are the men of Israel aren't saying, lie for us. <clears throat> Verse 17, the men said to her, we will be made us to swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you will bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which did let us down by, and you shall gather to you the house of your father, uh, and your mother and your brothers, all your father's household, it should be that whoever shall go out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood will be on his own, on his own head, we will be guiltless. Whoever shall be with you in the house, his blood will be on our head, if any hand be on him. But if you utter this our business, we will be guiltless of your oath which you have made us to swear. Behold, she, uh, she said, according to your word, so be it. She sent them away, they departed, she bound a scarlet line on the window, they went, they came to the mountain, abode there three days, and to the pursuers were returned. Pursuers sought them throughout all the way and didn't find them. The two men returned, descended from the mountain, passed over, came to Joshua, the son of Nun, told them all that had happened to them, and they said to Joshua, truly Yehovah has delivered into our hands all the land, moreover all the inhabitants of the land do melt away before us. Okay? So, taking this text, many have said, look, Rahab lied. And not only did she lie, and not, not only did she say that she's not condemned here in the text, she's later exalted in the New Testament as an example of faith, and as an example of works being uh, of faith being completed by works in the book of James. So the book of Hebrews and the book of James both talk about Rahab. But the thing is, what says the scriptures? Do they extol her for lying or for believing God? There's a difference. We need to look at it. We'll get into that text. Okay. <clears throat> I'm on this subject today <clears throat> because, uh, for one, this needs to be addressed. Uh, and it's a good time this week because earlier this week, uh, one of my, uh, I guess, former Facebook friends had put up uh, a question on his wall saying, is lying always wrong or are there exceptions? Um, and I've let it sit for a couple of days because I know this is something I wanted to address because this is something I've heard come up in the past uh, years. Over, over the past couple of decades, I've heard this come up, and oftentimes people will bring up the Ten Commandments and say, hey, don't you realize the Ninth Commandment isn't against lying? You're free to lie. It just says you can't bear false witness against your neighbor. You can lie all you want. <laughs> Read it. That's what it says. Seriously. And this argument even came up on this man's page. Was that God calling? Lion's always wrong, man. Lion's always wrong. So, is lion always wrong? Are there exceptions? Is Rahab an example where lying is right? Is it the lesser of two evils concept? Lesser of two evils is still evil, right? All right. Now, I want to say that the, the, the guy who, who uh, had put this up, I understand what his intention was. His, his intention was he was standing against the general Phariseeism that goes out in the, in the COGs where people are more hung up on the letter of the law than actually walking in love one towards another. And I commend him on that aspect. I would commend him more if he actually walked out what he's trying to extol in words. 
but his actions towards me were not that of patient kindness, gentleness, or love. That's why I say he's a former friend on Facebook. He unfriended me when I addressed him on this. So another example that comes up is from Exodus chapter 1. The king of Egypt spake unto, unto the Hebrew midwives. This is back in the time of baby Moses. All right. And he spoke to the Hebrew midwife. So the name of one was Shifra, and the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and you see them upon the stools, if it be a son, you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not as the king of Egypt had commanded them but save the men children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, they are lively. They're delivered before the midwives come in. So they're saying, like, she Egyptians take a while, their labor takes a while, so we can get there to deliver the babies, we can see them. But by the time we show up with the Hebrew women, they already gave birth. We didn't have a chance to see if it was a male or female because it already happened and, and we didn't get a chance to get the baby and kill it. Now, they lied to save their own skin. But it says, God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, he made them houses. Okay, now there's I'm not going to get into that, that verse and what that verse in of itself is about. There's a lot of uh, different views on that. But the idea here again is that God rewards people for being liars. It's not said in that way, but that's what they're saying. That God rewards them because they lied. No, that is not the case. God rewarded them because they feared God, which it says in this text twice. They feared God. <clears throat> and so I said, these texts come up. Exodus 20, 16, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Deuteronomy 5, 20, neither, sh neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. So if you bear false witness for your neighbor, that's okay. But if you bear it against him, now you've broken the law. If I say, I saw Ron rob the bank, and he didn't rob the bank, now I've transgressed the law. But if I say, yeah, Ron's the president of the bank, and he's really not. I'm just trying to impress someone. I haven't wronged him because I didn't speak it against him. I spoke it for him, so that's okay. No, that's not what the text says. Lying was not sanctioned and right and holy in the Old Testament, just because the Ninth Commandment says such and such. People often will take one text and run off all crazy with it, I've heard people do it like what the Sabbath, uh, Ten Commandments. Hey, nowhere says in there that you have to have a meeting on the Sabbath day. You just got to rest that day. Therefore, you can do whatever you want. Well, other text says it's a holy convocation, right? <clears throat> so let's look at other texts in the Scripture. Proverbs 12, 17 says, He that speaks the truth shows forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. So, are we called to show forth righteousness or to show forth deceit? Righteousness, right? Proverbs 19.5 says, A false witness shall not, shall not be unpunished, and he that speaks lies shall not escape. 
Now, if you remember, I've talked in times past about Hebrew and the way Hebrew is structured, that it speaks in poetic form uh, and often uses uh, a literary device known as doublets, where it says the same thing twice in two different ways. Here's an example. A false witness shall not be unpunished. He that speaks lies shall not escape. He that speaks lies is equal to a false witness, shall not be unpunished is equal to shall not escape. It's saying the same thing in different words. So a false witness is one who speaks lies. Is lying condemned in the commandments, even of itself? Yes, it is. A false witness shall not be unpunished. He that speaks lies shall perish. And again, verse 9, once again, a doublet. He who speaks lies will perish. Proverbs 14.5 says, A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. We are called to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. Are we supposed to be, are we supposed to hear, well done, my good unfaithful servant? Or are we supposed to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? Right? So a faithful witness will not lie. Right? What does Torah itself say? Leviticus 19, 11 to 12 says, You shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall you profane the name of your God. I am Yehovah, I am the Lord. And as I've gone over in times past in the sacred name uh, series I've done, profaning his name includes uttering lies in his name, or as a Christian. If I do anything that's hypocritical to our new nature, our nature of holiness in Christ, we profane his name. So we're told directly here, don't lie to one another. Oh no, somebody says, oh look, you know, well that just means within the community. I can't lie to my fellow Israelite, but I can lie to someone else. Really? Where's that in the scriptures? Psalms 12. Verse 2 to 3 says, They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue they speak proud things. So this would cover even that category, you know those, those colored lies? The white ones that they often people say are little. If you speak flattery towards someone, if you speak things that aren't true because you're afraid to hurt feelings, you know what? We should be compassionate one towards another. It doesn't mean we have to be liars. The Scripture says God is compassionate towards us all, yet the Scripture says God cannot lie. Right? So here again, I mean, here's kind of the dichotomy, the false dichotomy that's, that was being put forth on, on uh, this man's page. The idea, he was trying to show how love is above law. What I was trying to tell him, look, love does not eclipse the law or eclipse holiness and cut it out. See, because God, the scripture says God is love. You want a definition of love? God. God is love. In the scripture, as I just said, says God cannot lie. So to say that there's times if we operate in love that we have to lie is a lie. Because God always operates in love and he never lies.
Proverbs 6, verse 16 and 19. says, These six things does the Lord hate. There's six things that the Creator, God, who is love, hates. Seven are an abomination to Him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to run into mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among the brethren. A lot of these can be intertwined, and oftentimes when one's happening, all of them are the rest of our happening. But something he hates, he finds abominable, is a lying tongue and a false witness who speaks lies. Now, if the Lord hates it, is he ever at some point going to say, put this in utility belt to use at some time in your, in your war game with Satan? Put this in your belt of truth. Equip your belt of truth with a lie so you can pull it out at some point when you need to defend somebody for the faith. When you need to protect someone, you can protect them with a lie because that's what lies do. Is that sound? Is that biblical? We need to learn to discern, brethren, and understand what the scriptures really say and what they're really calling us to. Proverbs 12, 19 says, The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. And we have other scriptures that will be, we'll see this in the New Testament as well. We, all liars have their place where? In the lake of fire. So a lying tongue's for a moment. How, how is that if the lying tongue is the tongue of the Christian? And that's what we're supposed to do to further the kingdom or to protect people, is to lie for them. How is that if Christians have eternal life? How is our lying tongue just for a moment? Okay, is this for a moment we lie? And then we put it away and then we wait till we got to lie again at some other point? No, we're not called to be liars. We're called the truth. We're called to leave lies, to put away lying. We speak every man truth to his neighbor. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Yea, he has said it once, he has said it twice. They that deal truly are his delight. A righteous man hates lying. Why? Because a righteous man will put on the mind of God who himself says he hates lying. That's our that's that's the problem where people are going with this. Because they're not putting on the mind of Christ. They're not putting on the Spirit of God and walking by the will of God, but by their own will and by their own might and their own power. A righteous man hates lying. This is the mind we need to put on, brothers and sisters. We need to hate lying. Hmm. Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, he had said in the previous verse that I'll, we know a law is good if it's used lawfully. But he says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. It's made for the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, the sinners, unholy, profane, which includes the murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, the manslayers, 
whoremongers, them that defile themselves with mankind, men stealers for liars and perjured persons. If there is any other thing contrary to sound doctrine, being a murderer of your father is contrary to sound doctrine. It's ungodly, it's lawless, it's disobedient, it's the way of a sinner, it's unholy, it's profane. Being a murderer of your mother is against sound doctrine. Being a liar is against sound doctrine. Peter, in his first epistle, chapter 3, verse 10, says, He that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. In case you don't understand what guile is, guile is deceit, lies. If we want to have eternal life, we're to keep our tongue from speaking lies. Here again is a double. Refrain your tongue from speaking evil, your lips from speaking guile. Is the doublet concept here from Peter. Revelation 21, verse 8 says, The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and some liars have their part in the lake of fire. Oh, no, all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, of course, we realize there are murder, murderers or former uh, whoremongers or idolaters or liars who have come to life in Christ Jesus, but they have put off the old man and put on Christ Jesus. So are them, there are some who were abominable, some who were murderers, some who were liars, who have now put on Christ, and they don't have this for their future. But those who haven't will continue in lies and whoremongering, whoremongering and idolatry and will face the lake of fire. Revelation 21, verse 22 to 27 says, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it, and the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them that which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever that works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So those who are written in the Lamb's book of life are those who don't work abominations, who don't defile, and who don't make lies. Do you see this? Do you get this from the scriptures? Am I reading something? In, am I performing ice of Jesus right now? Am I lying to you right now and saying this? The scripture does say this, right? That those in the book, Lamb's Book of Life are those who don't work abominations or make a lie? Verse 14 and 15, chapter 22, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are the dogs, the sorcerers, the whoremongers, murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves and makes a lie. Now tell me, is the scriptures only against people who speak falsely, and bear a false witness against someone, said someone so did this and they really didn't? Or is it against all forms of lying?
off on flying? Anyone disagree with that? Is there any is there any lying that's okay? Exceptions to the lie? So in my discussion with the man, this is a, this is a brief discussion that happened yesterday. Um, one over the course of maybe six or seven uh, posts or comments um, over the course of maybe an hour, hour and a half, uh, before he decided to unfriend me because he didn't like what I had to say. But what one of his points was when people wanted to def wanted to say, "Hey, look, we shouldn't lie. There's no exception." So, like in the the one case, he answered a woman, and he said, "So, if a rapist is looking for you, do you expect your husband to tell him where you are? Because your husband can't lie." Oh well, that's a third option. See, that's what, and, I, and I pointed out to him. So and we'll, we'll come to that as well. So I had the discussion with him, and right again, this is his first jump on me. Uh, I only have so, so much of it because only some of it was on my phone because I can't now see his page, so I can't copy word for word everything that went down. But he said, I would hope if a rapist was looking for your wife, if you knew she was hiding inside the house, you would at least attempt to deceive him, if not knock him on the head. If I were ever in trouble, I sure would not want to depend on your kind of Christian to help. So he wants to depend on a liar to help him. He doesn't want someone who will stand for holiness to help him. So therefore, he doesn't want God to help him. He doesn't want Jesus Christ to help him because they don't stand for lies. He wants someone who walks in the image of Satan to help him. Now realize, he ain't thinking that way. He doesn't realize that's what he's saying. But that's what he's saying. He's saying, if I'm not willing to lie for him, I must not love him. Hmm. Is that, is that a proper equation? I asked him, would God, lie, would God lie for you? Would God lie for you? Well, we already know what the scripture says. Titus 1 2, in hope of eternal life, God that cannot lie, how before the world began, and also says in Hebrew that two immutable things, and one of those things is God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. And yet God is love. Perfect. But he doesn't want someone who stands for perfection and for holiness to be his defense in his day of trouble. He wants a liar to be his defense in the day of trouble. And that saddens me. And again, I, I don't say this to his shame. I'm not trying to shame the man. I was trying to instruct the man to understand there's a higher calling in Christ Jesus. And stop telling people to set the bar here, and it's good to lie. That some lies are good. That is a lie, and it's not good. Would Jesus lie for you? God, who so loved the world, who gave his only begotten son, who by his stripes you are healed, who bore all your sins upon the tree, who literally laid down his life's blood for you, would he lie for you? No. Jesus would not lie. For you or I.
This one is often brought up if I have it for my my uh, title slide. You're in Nazi Germany. Nazis come to you. Where's the Jews that are hidden? Tell me where the Jews are. What do you do? Do you say, oh, I, I, I hid him in the compartment of my floor? Or what do you do? See, because in my, my discussion with this man, there's only two options, A or B. Tell him where the Jews are or lie about the whereabouts of the Jew. A or B. That's not true. That's a false dilemma. That's called a false dilemma. When you're only told there's two options. There's not only two options. And again, notice this option. It's an option for you to lie or not. God has given us free will. We have the option to sin any way we want to. But we got to realize with that option, there comes a price tag and a consequence. Now, option C, we don't have to say a thing. Or we can operate with the faith in or wisdom of Jesus and ask them some question. As I told him when he asked me what would I do in the case of my wife, you know, he, he, well, actually, he, and he insinuated I would do nothing. And said, why do you equate not saying where my wife is uh, you know, or, or saying where my wife, I only had two choices. I said, that's falsehood. I said, I can call the man to repentance, as we should be doing any which way. What are you doing? And if the man takes my life, then he takes my life. Again, if we're called to the higher calling of love, lay down our lives, and that includes Keeping the truth within, not having to reveal it. You're not a liar if you don't open your mouth. And you can go to your death, not revealing the secret of where the Jews are hiding, where the spies are hiding with Rahab, where my wife is hiding from the intruder. I'm not required to speak. That's what I said. Where am I required to speak? What it says, thus says the Lord, when someone asks you a question, you must answer. There's no commandment that says I must answer. There's no commandment I must reveal where my wife is hiding. Now, we, again, as you have these discussions and you step outside the realm of Scripture, it's so easy to step into the absurd. So now he starts equ equating, well, even hiding is a deception. You're deceiving. But then he tells me, well, God could hide me. I said, wait a second. So you're, you got bad math here because if God could hide you and God can't lie, how could hiding you equal deception, which equals a lie? Your math is wrong. So regarding Rahab, what says the scriptures? For what cause was Rahab upheld as an example of faith? Was it because she was a, a liar? Behold, Rahab the liar. Go and do likewise. Behold, Rahab the harlot. Go and do likewise. No. She was a harlot. Yeah, go be a harlot. Hey, she was extolled. Hey, she was being a harlot at the time, and she's being a harlot and being a liar. And you think you can justify being a liar? And then be a lying harlot too. Why not? If we're going to justify the one sin, why not the other? Because she was doing both when she was protecting the spies.
By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not because she had lied to her king's men. Oh, I can't lie? That's not, oh, it wouldn't be righteous of me to lie and change the scriptures just to justify this doctrine that people want to say it's okay to lie? Oh, okay. Well, let's not read that. Let's read what the scripture says then. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies with peace. This was the example of her faith. She received the spies with peace. She didn't try to fight them off. She received them. In fact, she declared by faith, as we read earlier, I know Yehovah has given you the land. Says all these things and says, then Yehovah, your God, he is God in heaven above on earth. And she confessed faith. That's why she's in the hall of faith. Now, many people confess faith and they falter. Even as they walk, it doesn't mean they're faltering is what we're supposed to do. Abraham had faith he was going to have a son, but when he faltered and laid with Hagar, doesn't mean that's what we're supposed to do. The disciples faltered at times. It doesn't mean what we're supposed to do. Just because they were people of faith. For what cause was Rahab upheld as an example of faith made perfect by works? Was it for lying? Does James 2.25 say likewise, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she deceived the king's men and had sent them out the wrong way? Is that what it says? No, it's not. It doesn't say about her deceiving the king's men. It says she received the messengers. It doesn't say she deceived the king's men. She received the spies and sent them out another way. It has nothing to do with what she said to the king's men. It had to do because she believed, and because she believed, her works followed her beliefs. These are the works that are being extolled. Not what she said to the king's men. We've got to be careful not to read into the text something that it is not saying. And if you remember in times past, I wonder when I've done message messages, I did a series or um, a message on fornication before, and a lot of times people want to sit there and say, "Oh, look, Judah, Judah went and laid with a harlot, and it's not condemned." Oh, so that means you can go off and lay with whores? No. Just because something is not necessarily condemned right there in the story doesn't mean that it is a right thing to do. We are called to be children of light. What does light do? Light exposes darkness. Sorry, lies, lies cannot be white. They are not light. They do not expose darkness. They are darkness. Lies are black. Men may take them and white them like a sepulcher, but that's all they are is a grave marker. You're a grave marker if you're a liar. We are called to be children of light. Isaiah 63, 8 says, He says, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. If we are his people, we should be children that will not lie, and he will be our Savior. Paul told the brethren in Ephesus, Wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, who remembers one of another. Let no corrupt communication proceed from your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. <clears throat> he told the brethren in Colossae, lie not one to another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds. In other words, the liar is the old man. So in times of trouble, it isn't like, oh, wait, quick, resurrect the dead, become a liar again. 
and now I'm the great protector. No, what is what is what is the our our warfare dress? Ephesians six. When we're in battle, we wear the belt of truth. Not the belt of lies. That lies aren't to protect us or protect someone else. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus Christ is the head of this body. Being the body of Christ, we are also supposed to serve as the way, the truth, and the life. Or we are one with him, as he has prayed to his Father that we would be. We should be the way of truth. There's no lie in the truth. Jesus had said to the Samaritan woman that those who worship must worship in spirit and in lies. No, and in truth. This is the way of truth. Is what we're called to. It's not part-time truth. I am the truth. It is not some truth. It's not mingled truth. The truth. Now I ask, and I asked this of him, and he didn't answer me. It says in the text that Jesus came as one born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law in Galatians 4.4. 4. And he says that he, he came to his own, and he had to be sinless to be the Savior. Could Jesus have lied while he walked on earth and still be our Savior? That's the first thing I asked the guy. No answer. So I proceeded with other questions and statements. Could Jesus have lied and still be our Savior? So why aren't we saying, why aren't we putting on the mind of Christ then? Why aren't we saying, well, what would he have done? If he was Rahab, what would he have done? Why are we settling for Rahab? Is it ever the will of God for Christians to lie? Think about that. Here again is something he wasn't thinking about because he's saying there are certain times when it's okay. It's, it, so if it, you're justifying it, that means if it's okay, it means it's no longer wrong. It's the right thing to do. And that, if it's the right thing to do, that means that's God's will. What you're saying is it is the will of God for Christians to lie. That's falsehood. That is a lie. Yes, let me say this. There is an example in the Old Testament where he sent a lying spirit out. Go back and read that text. Beware of your assumptions. Don't assume that it was a holy angel who went out to be a liar. He sent Satan to Job. And show me any example where he asked the Christian, who will go and be a lying prophet? Anywhere. Don't uh, cause people to stumble by the way you divide the word. Divide it rightly. There is no scripture that justifies lying for a Christian. Anyway. Who wants us to lie? God or Satan? 
According to this, see, and I asked him this too. This is, this is when he unfriended me. So I asked him, I said, Do you, who wants us to lie, God or Satan? Satan. Satan is the father of lies. So, why are you, this is what I asked him, so why are you telling brethren that God wants you to lie? Who told you that? Who whispered that in your ear? Who is the father of lies and liars? Is it God or Satan? Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. The lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. Because he is a liar and the father of it. So who invented lying? Satan. So whose image are you bearing when you're a liar? Whose likeness are you following when you're a liar? If we believe that lying is sometimes right, we are saying it is sometimes right to act more like Satan than God. Is that really what you believe? Is that really what you're going to teach other brethren? It's okay to act more like Satan than God at times. It's okay to lie. What do you do in this situation? <laughs> what do you do in this situation? Word? Word? What old Rahab do? Is that what we ask? Is that what our, our, you know, our bracelet says? What old Rahab do? So that's what I'm going to do. What old Rahab do? That's what I'm going to do. Because he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying by the Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, unto the knowledge of the Canaanite harlot, to the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Rahab. Because that's our goal. Is that your goal? To be equivalent to a Canaanite harlot? That's not my goal. That's not our goal in Christ. To be equal to a midwife in Egypt. Our goal in Christ is to attain to the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He is the bar, both in English and in Aramaic. He is the <laughs> he is the bar. It's the word that we're to look to. Not all Rahab. Jesus Christ is the standard. When we come to that situation, before we even come to that situation, stop it. You have to have it settled in your hearts. And again, if you walk in faith and you walk by the Spirit, is the Spirit ever going to tell you to lie? Not the Holy Spirit. Is the Spirit of God ever going to tell you a lie? Because the Spirit of God is the Spirit of love. And there is no lie in love. Lies are one of the works of the flesh. And I know, I know what you're saying, but, oh, but, but no, I'm not doing it for my own good. I'm doing it for the person. I'm, I'm laying down my life for them. You know what? Corinthians talks about those who 
say they give themselves to be burned or something and say, but it's really not love. And we're not loving God when we're not submitting our every thought to Jesus Christ. And we're not walking in holiness towards Him and all these things. But I, I am not saying by any means that, that Rahab won't be in the kingdom. God is graceful. God is graceful. He forgives her lies. He's washed it under the blood of Christ. Because of her faith, He forgives the lie of the Hebrew midwives. Now, because a lie has been forgiven, do we set that as our standard? Oh, that lie. Hey, he forgives those lies. It's okay. You could be a liar now. Isn't that turning grace into license? This is what this man is doing on his Facebook page and doesn't even realize what he's doing. He's turning grace into license. It's okay to be a liar because they did it if they're in the hall of faith. David was a murderer and adulterer. He's in a, oh, I can be a murderer and adulterer now. No. Don't turn grace into license. It isn't what did Rahab do? What did the Egyptians do? What did Peter do? When, oh, we can deny Christ. It's okay when someone comes, when the Christian persecution happens, it's okay, we can deny him. Peter did it. It's okay. We can deny him. We'll still have eternal life. Uh, that's not what Jesus says. Don't take the grace that was extended Peter and, and, and drape it on yourself. That ain't your place. We need to be discerning with what the Scriptures say. And we need to aim for holiness in all things. And again, that's not of ourselves. If we walk after the flesh, we're going to perish. If we walk after the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, including lying. Right? Be holy, brothers, sisters. Be holy. Don't settle for anything less than Christ-likeness. All right? God be with you and keep you. Walk in love one towards another and don't lie against the truth.